Hello, and welcome to our discussion about issues of importance to the caucuses. I'm Joanne Lasoski, author and journalism educator. The newest development in the Azerbaijan-Armenian War focuses on the introduction of the U.S. State Department into the current mix of countries trying to quell the fighting. Azeri fighting forces have taken some of its territory back, so how does this change the negotiations for peace? With me today, we are so very fortunate to have Ambassador Matthew Bryza, former U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan from 2010 until 2012, the Senior Non-Resident Fellow at the Atlantic Council Think Tank, who wouldn't want to be part of a think tank, mm. and Ambassador Bryza is also the former co-chair of the OSCE's Mintz Group, the group of mediators working for almost 30 years to win the peace in the Nakaro karabakh region. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today, Mr. Ambassador. No, oh, thank you, Dermot Lasowski. If I can say Joanne. Yes, please, say Joanne. Thanks. So, Thanks for having me. You bet. You were involved in the peace talks for years, mm -hmm. and now the war has waged in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan Azerbaijan for three weeks now. Twice ceasefire attempts have seemed to fail almost immediately after they were brokered. And now the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, has invited the foreign ministers of both countries to Washington, D.C. What do you think? Are you hopeful that this tactic might work? Well, first of all, I, I think it's long overdue. I mean, the United States is one of three co-chair countries of the OSCE's Minsk group. The others are Russia and France. I mean, President Macron has, in my mind, disqualified France as an impartial mediator because he's tilted so much in favor of one side happens to be Armenia in this conflict. And President Putin has been playing the, the proper role. It's hard for me to say that sometimes, uh, to give President Putin credit for anything, but he has been. Uh, making sure that Russia did play the appropriate role as mediator throughout these last three weeks. Uh, he's the one who brokered the ceasefire on October 9th, and he's the one who actually compelled Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan to return to the negotiations in good faith, at least at least to sign his name that he would do so, although Pashinyan didn't, and he, he, he's you know essentially walked back that commitment, and we can go into more detail as, as to what that means. So I think that the biggest problem with the Minsk Group during its entire existence is that it hasn't had top level U.S. involvement, uh, except on rare occasions. So and by top level, I mean the secretary of state and the president. Um, yeah, I spent many, many hours over the course of the years directly with Russia's foreign minister, uh, Lavrov, uh, having lunch with him, with my Russian and French counterparts, brainstorming for hours, three, four hours, multiple days. He really cared. And. You know, to see the U.S. Secretary of State to talk about Nagorno-Karabakh, that was that was almost impossible to do. So it's time. It's time for the United States at the appropriate, this is the political level, to uh, to dispense of its responsibilities and duties as a Minsk Group co-chair. I, I think that <clears throat> there's not going to be any breakthrough on Friday, though. Uh, and, and by the way, the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia will be in Washington after, of course, being in Moscow to see President Putin. Um, I think that's good, though. I think, you know, that we, one could argue there's maybe some coordination going on. Not sure that's how Secretary Pompeo sees it, though. I think he's trying to steal some of the some of the limelight. Um, but you know, Azerbaijan's military success over the course of these last really three days has been remarkable. And I think unexpected, even for Azerbaijan's own military leaders, the it seems as if the Armenian army beginning you know, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh and then in Jabril and Fizuli and Zangilan, sort of just melted away. And we can, if, if it's of interest, we can go into why I think that happened. But I think that uh, it's time now for the Azerbaijani side to figure out if, it, if they want to consolidate their gains. And, yeah. Yes, I think that it's very interesting. I think it's very interesting that you can give us some insights into why the Armenian army seems to have fallen. Um, it's so really one-sided as far as the, except for bombing of civilian areas, which is what Armenia has been doing. Why is the Azerbaijani army so strong compared to the Armenian army? Yeah, that's because the Azerbaijani army modernized itself during the course of the last 10, five to 10 years. So it's, it bought, a lot of uh, drone technology and electronic warfare technology from Turkey and from Israel. 
um, which we're only starting to see now, uh, or, or we could go back to maybe February, has truly revolutionized warfare. And Armenia still has old style, essentially Soviet or post-Soviet style uh, armed forces, uh, heavily reliant on tanks, uh, on artillery, on fixed positions, uh, trenches, they're dug in. Uh, and as Turkey showed in a groundbreaking assault on Assad's forces and Russian forces in Idlib province of Syria last late February and March, um, the electronic warfare capability and sensors that you can put on drones now make it impossible for tanks or artillery or people on the battlefield to hide. They cannot hide. And then the precision of the uh, of the weapons themselves also allow for the, you know, once you find the stuff, you can destroy the air defenses, tanks, etc. So Armenia has no modern um, air defense capability that's sufficient to stop these sorts of Azerbaijani drone attacks coordinated with artillery. So instead of doing what Armenia had planned for, was for Azerbaijan to try sort of a classic you know, blitzkrieg style assault where you use artillery, armor, airstrikes to, to punch holes, uh, one or two holes in the defensive line and then drive as deeply as you can into the other side's territory. Azerbaijan had a different strategy, which was attrition. Step by step, uh, patiently, methodically, using these drone strikes and artillery strikes to destroy the high value Armenian military assets. And once Azerbaijan had destroyed pretty much all of those, then I think it started to, to frighten the heck out of the Armenian personnel, the soldiers, by launching these same sorts of highly precise drone strikes on them, on the people. And so I think it, it just got to a point Sunday and then really Monday and yesterday where it seems the Armenian troops started to flee the battlefield. They were thinking, we don't want to be incinerated by this, by this Azerbaijani approach that we cannot match. Now, it's going to get more difficult, though, now the fighting, because... Where all that stuff happened, I just described, that was in the, the lower Karabakh area. So it, it, it's called like plain, P-L-A-I-N Karabakh. It's not mountainous Karabakh. It's not Nagorno-Karabakh. So now the fighting is just shifting to the mountains. And as I was saying at the end before, Azerbaijan is going to face a difficult political decision. Um, does it press militarily all the way into uh, to Hankendi, Stepan Akert, and to Shusha, which is risky? It'll be difficult. There'll be big losses. Uh, the Azerbaijani supply lines will be extended and therefore vulnerable. Uh, and also politically, um, Azerbaijan will come under uh, attack in the international community even more than usual. Um, but then if you've gone so far with such relative ease and recovering so much territory, um, is, is it possible for President Aliyev to convince his, his citizens uh, that the smart thing to do is to stop and negotiate from a position of unexpected and dramatic new strength uh, at the negotiating table. It's a tough decision. They'll have to make it. Well, and that's something that I really want to talk to you about, too, is how the status quo, the fact that the territory has been regained by the Aziris, how has that now changed the negotiation? The, whole, the negotiation is not the same that you dealt with because there's different territory being occupied by a different country right now. So how will that affect the negotiation? Yeah, it's a dramatic shift. And it's still, it's, it's hard for me to change my sort of, my philosophical construct to realize how dramatically things have changed. Um, and it, this gets to the last point I was just making as well. So President Aliyev faces this difficult choice. He's, he's you know, Azerbaijan is, I think, on the verge of being able to cut off uh, Shusha and Hankindi uh, and the Lachin Corridor. And when that happens, uh, Azerbaijan can lay siege to those to those territories, and eventually the Armenians have to give up. And Prime Minister Pashinyan would be wise to to maybe get back to negotiations sooner rather than later, because I think Armenia's military situation is only going to get worse from here on out. He would have been smart to have gone back to the negotiating table on October 9th. So Azerbaijan is going to have much more leverage. I mean, until now, put it this way. The, the, the overall framework of the negotiations was that Azerbaijan had, had lost the last war and Armenia had won. Now it's the opposite. Azerbaijan will have won this war. Armenia will have lost. Um, so there'll be a temptation for the Azerbaijani side to really push its advantage. I understand that. 
Um, but I also think if President Aliyev is the same President Aliyev I've known for whatever it is, 22 years, my guess is he's going to be more prudent and realize that, okay, Azerbaijan is now, has, has recovered control of most likely all the seven surrounding territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, I, as the president, have always said that ethnic Armenians can remain in Karabakh in their houses as long as the Azerbaijanis can come home. So I would use this great leverage, if I were he, to get a timetable in place for the return of Azerbaijanis to their old homes, to their old villages, uh, and a timetable for the withdrawal of any, uh, or a demand for all Armenian soldiers to leave uh, the Gorno karabakh um, And that still allows, though, for the, the, these basic principles that I've been discussing uh, to be finalized, I think, quite quickly. I mean, the, the idea of, Nagorno, of the basic principles is a land for peace solution, a classical land for peace. Azerbaijan recovers its seven territories. Uh, there's a peacekeeping force and a connection between Armenia and, and Nagorno-Karabakh, the Lachin Corridor. Uh, and then Nagorno-Karabakh gets some sort of an interim legal status that's ambiguous. And that the final legal status will be decided at some point in the future. I think right now it's actually quite easy to finalize those principles that were agreed already in 2009, in January. But the two leaders, then Armenian leader Serge Sarkisian and President uh, Aliyev of Azerbaijan, just, they didn't trust each other. And they then after they had agreed preliminarily, they tried to change the, the provisions a bit. I think now um, President Aliyev still would like to finalize that, that basic framework. And I think Prime Minister Pashinyan does not have any choice. He publicly abandoned this framework that had been preliminary ag agreed after years and years of negotiations, I think that really upset President Aliyev. And now I think maybe Russia's role should be to make clear to the Armenian prime minister, you have to negotiate on the basis of the basic principles. The parties to the negotiations do not include Nagorno-Karabakh authorities. It's Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia under international law and take whatever deal you can get because the situation is only going to get worse for you. Thank you, Ambassador. That was really insightful and interesting that you have such great knowledge of both sides and the perspectives of both leaders, too. And I wanted you sort of hinted a little bit at this, but I wanted to get more into the idea of the Azerbaijan economy being built on oil and gas yeah. and that bridge that um, might be taken that would make a difference in how Azerbaijani gas gets disseminated throughout the whole world. Mm -hmm. So what part does this economic issue of oil and gas and other economic things play into this conflict? I, I think the only role it's really played is uh, <coughs> that the, the Baku Tbilisi oil pipeline uh, opened up huge new economic opportunities for Azerbaijan. And, I, and I'm actually really proud of that. that's one of the, that's the project I probably spent more time on than any in my government career. That together with the South Caucasus gas pipeline uh, really changed the, the geoeconomic position of Azerbaijan because first the oil uh, enabled this unbelievable economic renaissance in Azerbaijan. And, you know, as we all know, I mean, anybody who's been to Baku, uh, over the course of the last decade has seen how, how dramatically things have changed since, since really 2006 when, when the pipeline started to operate. Uh, but then the gas pipeline did something else. It Yes, it generated more revenue, but it also connected Azerbaijan physically and economically to, to NATO, right? I mean, to Turkey. And now with the expansion of that uh, pipeline into the southern quarter, Azerbaijan now has a direct physical connection to the European Union. And so I think that probably... Has, has enabled Azerbaijan to, uh, to purchase these world-class weapons and to be confident that it can win a military conflict. Um, depending upon which side of the conflict you're on, you think that's either fantastic or a disaster. Um, but it, it, you know, that, that is what enabled Azerbaijan to, to, to win this war after having not won the previous one. Otherwise, though, in terms of maybe you're getting at also sort of the political or geopolitical implications of this energy infrastructure running through the area close, relatively close to Karabakh, but, but you know, Tovuz, where there had been fighting uh, in July, which is, you know, n n not adjoining Karabakh, but it's a bit removed. And there's been 
no damage to the energy infrastructure as a result of this conflict, which is exactly what happened when, when Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, in August. There was no damage to the same pipelines, nothing. Russia could have targeted the pipelines with you know, Iskander tactical ballistic missiles. It sent a couple Iskanders nearby, but didn't hit the pipelines. And in fact, uh, a crazy thing is that there, <laughs> there is a commercial agreement between Georgians and Russians for electricity uh, provision. And in, in Abkhazia, you know, there's a reservoir that's controlled by one side and the power comes to the other side and to Georgia. <laughs> that power agreement remained intact throughout the entire period of fighting. The electricity kept going, the reservoir kept operating, uh, and, and you know, the hydropower plant kept going. So um, people often think that, yeah, the, the, uh, the big players in the world are driven by a desire to control these economic energy assets, and that's really what the main driver of conflict. And in my experience, that's absolutely not true. What's happening between Azerbaijan and Armenia right now is purely a political or a political legal conflict. But yes, Azerbaijan was enabled to... Uh, in accordance with international law, regain its own territories uh, because of uh, the investment that, that came out of the uh, oil and gas wealth. Um, and and I, one more thing I'd like to say is I, since 2014, uh, you know, Azerbaijan has really worked at, uh, still at diversifying its economy. It's got a long way to go, but also on uh, tackling corruption uh, by implementing e-governance, right, and eliminating many of those previous interfaces between officials and common people. And I, I think that's had a, a, a strong and positive impact on Azerbaijani society, though, though corruption remains a huge problem, of course. But that's getting away from oil and gas. But, you know, people normally think oil and gas and corruption go hand in hand. So I wanted to touch on that as well. Well, and you, you also mentioned something about Turkey. And I want to talk a little bit about what Turkey has to gain or lose. And Secretary of State Pompeo has said that Turkey's role has increased the risk for further violence. And why would he say that? It doesn't sound like he is being sort of even handed in his discussion. Yeah, he's not. In, 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 you know, in those statements that you're talking about, um, he, I think he was trying to be even handed. And like he said, well, I hope the Armenians can protect themselves against Azerbaijan. But in, in trying to be even and trying to say nothing, I should say, he actually said something terrible. And, and you know, he's not a professional diplomat. And boy, does it show. Uh, that was just that was ignorant, what he said, and wrong. And that, that really calls into question the US's ability to be an impartial mediator, just just as I was saying about uh, French President Macron. Um, and so, but, but Turkey's role, going back to your, your original question in this segment, it's been huge. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I've never been comfortable with the vanilla diplomatic argument that you don't want arms to go to either side because that just enhances the violence. I remember way back when, in like 1992, I was uh, at a baseball game with my boss at the time, who was the head of European policy at the State Department. And I, and I said, uh, boss, do you really think it was a, it's been a good thing not to let the, not to let the, uh, the Bosniaks, so in, you know, in, in Bosnia, uh, arm themselves while, while the Serbian side is able to slaughter them? Because that's been your policy. And he, and he looked down, and he said, you know, no, I don't know that that's the right thing to do. This has been really brutal for me. So, so in this case... Um, okay, yeah, Turkey, by providing those drones to Azerbaijan, allowed Azerbaijan to, to win a war, but it also <laughs> allowed four United Nations Security Council resolutions, which is the highest expression of international law, uh, to be implemented. The rest of us, the rest of the world community, did nothing for all these, whatever, 27 years to implement those Security Council resolutions. Azerbaijan took matters into its own hands. You could argue that it's had a, it's had a limited military assault. It has certainly preserved the lives of a lot of Azerbaijani soldiers. Um, a lot more on both sides would have died had Azerbaijan uh, uh, implemented a traditional blitzkrieg assault. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think we're now much closer to the re resolution of this conflict than we've ever been before. So I, I wish Secretary Pompeo would see it in that light. You, know, you have a chance, Mr. Secretary, now to wrap this up in a way that's in accordance with international law and with a minimal loss of life. And that's what he should be talking about, not saying Turkey has you know, tilted too much to one side or is, is enhancing the violence.
Well, and I can't help but be skeptical at the timing of bringing these two parties together in Washington, D.C., that it has some hopeful effect on the election outcome. No question about it. This is it's, it's a stunt in my mind. Where was he all this time? Where was he for these years? He's been secretary of state. Where was he? Nowhere to be seen. So, yeah, we're, we're a week and a half before the election. Of course, he's looking for a way to make it look like, yes, the administration and the president uh, have done something meaningful uh, in international affairs. And I think that there, if he doesn't do what I recommended, really push the sides to finalize these basic principles, I think he's going to cause harm. Well, it seems like the Russians are playing the other side of it, too. And you hinted at this earlier. Is this a competition or a cooperation? In my experience in working on Nagorno-Karabakh, we had real cooperation between the U.S. and Russia. And I'll never forget this instance in um, September 2008. Um, just you know, a few weeks after Russia invaded Georgia, and I was also the Georgia guy, you know, in, in the U.S. government, and the, I, I had responsibility for our relations with a lot of countries. And in the middle of the war, Secretary of State Rice, she sent me to Georgia, and I said, I, I said what, "What am I supposed to do?" She said, "I don't know. Figure something out. Try to make it better. Or try to calm the Georgians. I'll be there in a couple of days." And so, like, I was completely at loggerheads with the Russians, and there, there was a, a night where I thought there was a good chance I was going to lose my life in a Russian uh, helicopter attack uh, on the Georgian president's office. So I couldn't have been more opposed to what Russia was doing th th than I was. Yet one month later, I was having lunch with, with the foreign minister of Russia, absolutely collaborating. And he served a Georgian soup as the first course called Harcho. And I said, Mr. Minister, why are you serving Harcho? And he looked up and he smiled. He said, I want you to know, you know, we also want to make peace. So we were able to be very creative and collaborative. And, and my guess is now um, Putin, I think, you know, might like to work together with the U.S. on this. You know, he is eager, maybe as eager as President Trump is to do something constructive with, with Putin. This should be the issue. But it feels like uh, Secretary Pompeo doesn't want to be that way. I, it feels like Secretary Pompeo wants this to be his show. I hope I'm wrong. And I know my successor as the Minsk Group co-chair is working well with his Russian and French counterparts. They're doing their jobs. But at that upper political level, it sure would be good if the three co-chair presidents came together with more than a written statement and really got involved to finalize this framework agreement. That, that's available. It's out there. I wonder if you think that uh, Secretary Pompeo may be affected by the powerful Armenian diaspora in the U.S.? Is that oh, nudge? For, oh, for sure. Oh, that's 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 definitely part of the you know the political calculus that, that that's driving him. He he's also he's been um, like like Macron. He's he's been opposite Turkey and and President Erdogan on a whole series of issues: Eastern Mediterranean, uh, in in Syria, obviously with the U.S. working with the YPG, uh, a branch of the PKK terrorist group. Uh, in Libya, the U.S. policy has been ambiguous. Sometimes the U.S. has seemed to be with uh, Al Haftar. Sometimes the U.S. Has, seems to support the government of national accord that's recognized by the United Nations. But most of the time, um, he's been, in my mind, uh, Secretary Pompeo has kind of been um, uh, playing to the, to the choir, to the Greek choir and the, and the Cypriot choir and the, the, the forces aligned uh, counter to Turkey, which then redounds to Azerbaijan's disadvantage. So the um, friend of my enemy is my enemy, or yeah. however that goes, right? <laughs> yeah. I want to talk a, a little bit about the IDPs, the internally displaced persons in Azerbaijan. They seem to be getting <coughs> such a very small, a, a small interest to the international press or to journalists around the world, or, and therefore to many of the people around the world are so, totally unaware um, you, you talked about them earlier, how 700 or more people who have been displaced as a result yeah. of the 1994 war. So yeah. I'm wondering why are those people less important maybe than the Armenian diaspora in the U.S. That it, or around the world that is hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away from the zone and from the conflict zone. And these poor IDP people in Azerbaijan are not getting the play that they should be. 
it's such a straightforward and thoughtful question and it's such a complicated answer. So there, so there are a few factors. One, in general, I think the world does really a terrible job in worrying about IDPs and refugees. It's just kind of like out of sight, out of mind. I mean, think of Israel, Palestine. I'm a huge supporter of Israel, by the way. Again, I don't know if you, well, your audience or your views, but I, I'm a huge supporter of Israel. Um, but, you know, the Palestinians have a right to return to their homes and, and they've been stuck for decades in these horrible refugee camps. But nobody cares that much. And that, that's wrong. And in the case of the Azerbaijani IDPs, part of it is that they're they're not visible to the international community. Um, but part of it is that I think Azerbaijan lost the narrative about this conflict from the very beginning. So you think back to how, how did this start? It didn't start like a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago. This started in 1988, right? When a group of, as they say in, in Russian, Zhuliki, so these tricky uh, ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, tried to gain prominence by pushing for the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh from the Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic at the time, right? And like none of us ever heard of Nagorno-Karabakh except, you know, okay, in graduate school and some obscure class on, you know, Soviet military power. I, okay, we talked about it for an hour. Um, but anyone who first heard about Nagorno-Karabakh heard about it from Armenian Americans who understandably said, hey, I have cousins or other relatives back in, in Soviet Armenia, and there's something amazing going on. They are fighting for their independence inside the Soviet Union. And it was complicated. Well, not independence from the Soviet Union, but from the Azerbaijan Soviet Socialist Republic. But still, it sounded like, wow, there's this, there's this freedom movement. Okay, exciting. Glasnost, perestroika is all happening. You know, next year, the, the Berlin Wall came down. Um, and so... Um, they're already seen as, as having a noble cause on their side, the Armenian side. Then you had the, the various clashes and, you know, the, the Sumgait attacks on ethnic Armenians and so many attacks on Azerbaijanis. You had the Hojili massacre against mm -hmm. Azerbaijanis. But by that time, the Armenian American community had, had won the narrative and characterized Azerbaijan somehow as the aggressor. And so I think a lot of people just thought, well, if Azerbaijan started the war and its people got kicked out of their houses, well, that's, that's too bad. That's how war works. But that wasn't honest. That wasn't fair. That wasn't true. And so that, that narrative has never been corrected. It's starting to get corrected now, though. And so I have way more hope for these Azerbaijani IDPs. For the first time ever, all the major news outlets, whether in print or you know, TV, they're all saying, Nagorno-Karabakh, ethnically predominantly Armenian, but territory of Azerbaijan. And a lot of them are even saying that Azerbaijanis were, were forced out. So the narrative is starting to change. And that's why, going back a few minutes, why I think it's so important for Azerbaijan now to, to be restrained in its victory. And don't vanquish Nagorno-Karabakh. Let the Armenians stay there in their houses, but make sure Azerbaijanis get to go back to their houses, and then Azerbaijan will come out of this with a huge international political victory, will be seen as the winner who's on the side of international law. Just think of what that will do for Azerbaijan. It'd be a positive effect. So I, I want to end with asking you about, I mean, you've hinted at it already, but I want to ask you about what you think the possibility is of the Minsk group to, once there is a ceasefire, to negotiate a new, um, win the peace. Can the men's group win the peace? I know you talked about France and the possibility that they may not be as um, unbiased and neutral as they have been in the past, but is this the end of the men's group? Do we need another group? What's the possibility of peace being won? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm convinced that at least for now, at least for now, President Aliyev uh, would like to go forward with finalization of the basic principles, which come from the Minsk group. Uh, I'm convinced Russia would like to keep going with the Minsk group, and I think the U.S. would. France is a problem. We already talked about Macron um, looking very biased, and, and we also talked about how Secretary Pompeo's statements may suggest a certain anti-Azerbaijani pro-Armenian bias, but I think that will pass. Uh, and I think Azerbaijan, the, 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 the momentum of Azerbaijan's success on the battlefield is, is going to change uh, some of that negative momentum or reverse it. Um, so the question is then who brokers uh, the settlement, if it's based on the basic principles or something else? Um, certainly Russia has to play a role. It will. And so then the question is, can, can Turkey do that? Turkey can play a role. Turkey is a member of the Minsk group. It's just not a co-chair 
Uh, and Turkey can play that important role inside Azerbaijan in, in helping people restrain their, their, their uh, nationalism and their goals and realize the best outcome is a political one that I talked about, where all the Azerbaijani IDPs return home and the, the Armenian community is safe, who wants to stay can stay. And the people eventually live next to each other. It'll take a long time to get to that. I know this. Everyone's feeling so raw right now, but but so if yeah, Turkey can play that role as a as a reassurer for Azerbaijan, but you still need somebody, some some organization to run the negotiations. And um, the Minsk group, it could be, it could be. I don't think it's totally dead, and I do think it had real achievements uh, at least up through two thousand and nine. Um, and then it was the, the politics of Azerbaijan and Armenia that, that prevented the finalization of, of those agreements. Um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that there will be a settlement also because I think, I think Armenia's political system is, is finished the way it used to be. Armenia's political system was run by or was driven by uh, extreme nationalists, the Dashnak Sutun, businessmen, oligarchs, some based in Moscow, some based in uh, Yerevan, uh, the old Karabakh clan, which in my experience was actually quite constructive in the negotiations, uh, and organized crime. And so that's a, a poisonous mix. And I think it's finished now. I think Pashinyan is, is his career is over. And I think we're going to see Moscow install someone who's more moderate and more like, believe it or not, Serge Sarkisian or Robert Kucharian, who were hated in Azerbaijan, but were much more stable than Pashinyan. And I think that new leadership is going to see the merit in having an organization like the Minsk Group that has Russia there, that has the U.S. there. And then if you're Armenian, of course you want France there, because then you've got the three countries in the world with the largest Armenian diasporas. And that can actually be helpful now, because that will provide the next leader of Armenia political cover to swallow the bitter pill and say yes, because Armenia has no choice. So I actually think the Minsk Group's not necessarily dead. Thank you very much for this time with us, um, Ambassador Bryza. And I know I can call you Matthew too because Please. I've known you for a I while. Should. So thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to talk to us, Matthew Bryza, former US Ambassador to Azerbaijan. Thank you so much, Joanne. It was a pleasure. Great questions. Thank I, you. I learned a lot. From the <laughs> I've learned from you as yeah, usual. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, we'll see you.